Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with one of the hardest working bassists on the heavy metal scene, Matt Snell. How are you doing? <laughs> great, Matt, great. People might have seen you on stage on numerous acts, Unveil the Strength, Kill Devil Kill, NVIDIA, Five Finger Death Punch, Maya Cumin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Maya Cumin. Yeah. There we go. And they might go, gee, that the bass player always looks like, they, they all look alike, and it's because it's you. So, <laughs> yeah. so we'll have to talk about all of this activity, but before we do, let's go back to the past. How did you get started in music and on bass? I started in music at the age of five, playing piano, and that moved into, you know, we had great school band programs back in the day. My parents were in the arts, my mom's an actress, dad's a producer, so we're always pushing the arts, so they got me into playing saxophone around fifth, sixth grade, and that's when I was introduced to jazz, so I was actually at band camp. If you can believe that, my parents would send us away every summer, but it wasn't in the woods, sadly. It was at a university, but uh, we would go to this band camp and study jazz for saxophone. So mm -hmm. I was learning, like, well, Charlie Parker solos and things like that in theory. And we got to sit in and watch these cats play, and one day a little bunch of dudes just came together to play for us, because uh, probably because the teacher didn't show up, I don't know. <laughs> but um, there was a stand-up bass player, and he did probably a three- or four-minute jazz bass solo, and it just... It changed my life, I and mean, that was it. I wanted to play bass forever, to the point that when I went to jazz competitions throughout high school, I would end up seeing a bass player in another band playing with a pick. I was still playing saxophone then, and I was like, why, why is he using that? You're supposed to use your fingers, you know? Yeah. So I was always kind of stuck there, and then, you know, I just I was hooked from the start, and then, you know, once I got into Iron Maiden and Metallica, oh, and just listening to those players, I mean, I, there was no choice for me. Guitar was never an option. I played it for maybe two or three months. I didn't like it. The bass was natural. I have relatively big hands. Mm -hmm. So it was easy for me. You know. Gotcha. Well, and in the sax realm, were you playing Barry or were you a bass clef? I started on alto like most, but I wanted to play Barry sax. I always thought that the kid who had the really big one that made the low notes was cooler. So when I got big enough to wind it, you know, I was able to take one home from school. Like I said, we were in the arts forever, so we made friends. I mean, I grew up in a small town, so we, we curated the band program. We made sure that we were friends. The director, like, sold us our dogs. You yeah. know, we were, you know, it was like family. So I was able to bring the instruments home, the ones that we couldn't afford. Like, because those, I mean, those instruments cost a fortune, and we didn't have any money. So yeah. I would borrow, I borrowed old Fender P basses. I borrowed the saxophones, whatever I needed from the school. And up until the day that I slipped on the snow and fell on top of one of the saxophones and crushed the horn on it really bad. So after that, I wasn't allowed to take it home anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> it was okay. From the school programs, did you pursue additional musical training? or? No, I'm like, as far as bass goes, I'm completely self-taught. Okay. Uh, like I said, my family's into music. My brother has a doctorate in music performance and runs a music department at a university. My cousin's an opera singer in Austria. You know, we've always just been musically inclined, I guess is the word. Mm -hmm. And so when it came to playing bass, you know, I just sat down and figured it out. And as I progressed and learned those things I wanted to play, I, I knew that there's like a strength training aspect to playing bass. Mm -hmm. And I really focused on that, you know. And, and as an adult, I was an auto mechanic for about 12 years. So hands and arms really strong, you know, twists and wrenches forever. So, but, you know, I did a lot of just strength training in the younger years and getting my spreads together and getting my fingers to work the way I wanted to. And then I started to learn technique and things like that. Getting into all of these bands, because you've been quite prolific, how has that kind of developed? Well, you know, I want to play. Mm -hmm. In the early days, you know, the old school way was you'd committed to the band and the band was your family. And then, you know, sometimes you got a bad brother or sister in that family. Yeah. And they pulled you back. And so there was a kind of an awakening for me around 18 or 19 to where I don't have to just sit in this one project because these other guys are doing some really cool stuff and they don't have a bass player. You know, where I jammed in Chicago, where I grew up, there was a big building just full of floors of rehearsal. So you'd find out this other band that needs a bass player or somebody can't do a show. So yeah, I'll do it. And every time I did something like that and went and played with that other band, I noticed I got better. And I noticed that my experience level was better. And it wasn't a day, you know, I, I was looked at it like a lot of my friends went to the bar to watch the football game. 
you know, I went to band practice. Mm -hmm. You know, I they wanted, and that's fine if they did that. But I wanted to like to perform and play and and do music because when you you know when you vibe with another group of people, there's nothing like it. You can't replace it. Yeah. And not to mention you look super cool. You know, and had a bunch of hair back in the day, and you could get girls and all that. You know, <laughs> that was secondary. Like I really just liked that energy from that performance. So. I tried to fish in as many ponds as I could because mm -hmm. everyone was making me better. I would try to join bands that were out of my league, you know, and I would have to sit at home the minute I got home from work until midnight and woodshed to get caught up to their level of playing. And then after six or eight months or a year, I kind of figured out their techniques and their chord progressions and what they're doing. And now it's time for me to find somebody even better. So I just kept kept that steamrolling and steamrolling all the way until I moved to Los Angeles and I was in, I don't know, four bands when Five Finger Death Punch got signed. Yeah. And that was a day of phone calling three other bands and saying, hey, we got the deal, it's coming through, you got to find somebody else, you know, and I'll do a couple more shows for you, but I can't. So that was a really great day for me, bittersweet because I loved playing with those other guys, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, a lot of those bands came up and made it as well. I did find listening to the music I found also, I think there's a kind of a common thread in almost the kind of the heavy metal that you're involved with. It has very much of a melodic approach. It's heavy hitting, and, you know, a lot of staccato hits oh, yeah. it in there. So the transition from band to band, I could see that that would be kind of seamless in a way where you didn't have to reinvent yourself entirely and no. go, now I have to do this so differently. No, not at all. And a lot of, I mean, my approach to bass is, like I said, I studied music, you know, from five until 18. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of influence in my parents, you know, but my parents didn't listen to popular music. They listened to weird music, you know, which at the time, which I thought was weird, but it was actually teaching me things that I didn't know. And I approach bass both through melody, but also as percussion. Yeah. You know, I, I have a way of playing bass that a lot of producers said, well, I've never seen anybody do that before. It's because my left finger is doing the kick drum, my right finger, you know, my two fingers over is doing the snare drum. So I kind of hit this, you know, and that, that clicked with me early. So I wanted to work, you know, if everyone says, yeah, you got to lock the drummer, absolutely. But there's more to it than that, for me anyway. So that's why all the strength training came in, because, you know, th these are really fast, so you got to get these really fast, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and... In your creative process of coming up with your lines, how do you go about that? You know, honestly, I, if somebody sends me a song and they want bass, I just listen to it for a day or so, put it in the car or whatever. You know, I'm a tattoo artist, so I sit there and listen to music all day anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and you just hear it, you know. And I think I hear it because of the wide variety of music that I listen to. Like, one of my favorite bands is Opeth. And, like, Opeth just has this sonic mastery. And it's, so it's not for everybody. But uh, I've gotten a lot of people into the band. I said, you know, just put it on and clean the house. Don't pay attention to it right now because you're not ready for it. You know, mm -hmm. when you really get into it, then it'll make sense. You know, and bands like Dream Theater back in the day, I used to listen to a lot of that. But there's just, a, a, you know, there's bass players who are failed guitar players and then there's bass players. I so I've, I've had this long-standing argument with several bands is why, why do rhythm guitar players exist? Yeah. They just didn't want to practice their scales. I, I don't understand, you know, because I'm doing that job right now. Yeah. You know, and click a pedal and double up if you need to for the live stuff. And, and so I just always approach it for like, what can the bass do to add to the song, but not take away from the vocal? And sometimes I get shot down. You know, I always send two takes. Yeah. You know, I record here, I send you two versions. Here's the simple one, and here's the, the fancy one. And, you know, usually, I mean, uh, about 50-50. I get my parts in every time, and otherwise it's, ah, we got to dumb that one down a little bit just because there's a vocal going on, which at the end of the day, we're working for the song. Another commonality that I found with a lot of the music that has been put forth by the bands that you've been with is message. And it is, I think, part of the musician, the artist's task to shed light, to put in perspective the issues at hand. And if, if we look back, you know, you think of like Dylan and... All these guys during the Vietnam War, you know, Credence with, you know, I'm not a senator's son. Mm -hmm. They've been making the statements that people would think but weren't necessarily willing to say out loud. And it's been the musicians that will bring it out and like, okay, we're going to put it out there. How involved are you in that process of creating the messages, like with the songwriting and, and going, okay, yeah, this is something that... I believe well, in too. The lyrical content I will leave up to the, the singer and it's kind of a big part of how I choose the project I'm going to work with. 
I was in a, in a band for a long time, did very well. There wasn't a lot of message there. You know, it was just kind of blah, blah, blah. And it always kind of bothered me. And then after a while, this version of who we were became who we were, and that's not who I was. So as I moved from that project into other projects, I've kind of focused on having sit-down conversations with the vocalist about, you know, what are we going to talk about? Because we have to tread lightly, especially in today's climate. You can't just say whatever you want anymore. You get canceled. It is what it is. Yeah. But but that just that's diplomacy. Learn learn to tell someone to go to hell and have them enjoy the trip. Yeah. You know. So how do we talk about this topic? And I mean, you're the poet. That's your job. You're the poet. I'm going to help you make the music. You're the poet. But here's a good topic. You know. Or he comes to me and says, Hey, I want to kind of do a song about this or that. How do we do it? Well, now you now you need a metaphor, because the key is always going to be in the metaphor. Mm-hmm. Like. I want to talk about the election we can find a metaphor for an election and then write a song around that so sure. i'm kind of like the cheerleader when it comes to that and it's so important you know my wife gets on me all the time too because you don't i love the words of this song and i'm so into the guitar part and the bass line and and the drums per- percussion wise that i don't even i never even bothered to listen to the words yeah. you know the melody but i didn't listen to the words so i go back and read it i'm like oh my god what a great message or sometimes like he said that he just needed a rhyme that's terrible so we try and stay away from that you know, so we can keep, I want to keep things positive, but they can still be real. Sure. Well, and I tend to do the exact same thing. I, when it comes to any song, it's the music's and the pattern and all of the, the musicality that catches my attention first. And it's been fascinating because in, even in later years, when I've gone back and listened to songs that I knew because I'd heard them way back when, and I actually listen to the lyrics, I'm going, oh, wow, that said that? I never realized that that's what that was about, you know, but it was chord changes or a minor key or something that went, oh, oh, yeah, that's... It creates a mood. Exactly. That's what I'm... And that's how you color it to go along with the message. And I think that's part of the beauty of what bass players do in addition to the percussive aspect. You know, a subtle note that you're adding in colors the whole thing. And one of the classic examples people that saw Flash Gordon the movie and, mm-hmm. and Queen did the soundtrack and right. they did the wedding march because Ming the Merciless was going to marry, was it Dale? I remember, yeah. They played it in minor keys and it was so good. I'm right. like, whoa, listen, that that's the best wedding march I think I've ever heard, you know, and it was just... It stopped being happy. Exactly. Yeah. And, and all it took, it was the same notes, it was the same tune, it was just twist it a little bit so there was that magic yeah it works great you, you create a mood and environment that's why music is so uh, people stick to it so much and they say oh that you know relationships end but the music lasts forever totally because you can still go back to that feeling that mood that and it's the magic that we get as humans that the song can create something and that's why you know people don't understand why i like a band like obituary i absolutely love obituary mm-hmm. but it's theater you have to look at it as theater, but it just puts me in this fun mood. My elbows come up, I want to pit, you know, and it's fun and it's, you know, it's almost, you know, cartoonish and it's just a blast for me. But then I'm also going to want to sit down and, and listen to, you know, Mastodon, which is a completely left turn and then go into an Opeth record, but then put on a Pantera from a good time in my life sure. and everything stops. I mean, we had, we had a battle in the shop yesterday. We decided that most master of puppets are ride the lightning which was the better record <laughs> so, so it just turned into us listening to both records back to back and while we tattooed for a couple hours and there's no answer we'll never come to an answer but we're going to do it again next week and see you know take a vote in the shop which what record do you like better and you know it's fun you know it's one of the gifts we get with music totally and since we're talking about that modality how are you getting your sound what are you playing on i've been playing ivan as basses since probably 1990. I kind of bounced around bases in the beginning with what I could afford or finance. I would mm-hmm. finance a base and then go take a car apart, fix it, flip it, sell it, pay off that base, you know, start the process over. And But they were, you know, lesser quality bases at the time. Uh, I got into playing sound gear bases. I was fortunate enough to get endorsed by them around 2007 or so, and I've been with them ever since. So I have a pretty big arsenal of sound gear bases that they've given me over the years. Mm-hmm different models, different size necks and things like that. They custom made a couple of destroyers for me when I was with Five Finger Death Punch nice. that are so big that they're hard to take around to the smaller shows now, so they're gonna be hanging on the wall here for a little while. Uh, Ampwise started on uh, SWR. I'm a real big fan of their, the way their round tone is, and that was influenced by 
early testament records. Mm-hmm. I went to find out what they were using and how they were getting their tones. Little did I know most of it was technique and strings, but at the time. So I still have that bass sound with that. It's just sitting on the shelf, but you know, no one can have that one. But I've been playing mostly Mesa Boogie for the last probably close to 20 years. Okay. You can see back here, these are my Titan B12s. That's a rig of those. I, the top one is just from this one of my cats. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is my, my, my portable rig, and this is my, my bigger, you know, larger tour rig. I just picked up a one of the Subway 800s. I spoke to them a couple of days ago. I said, I need something light because I lugged that thing around again last weekend. I'm like, nah, they're five and a half pounds, 800 watts. So if I'm doing fly dates and things like that, I can just literally slip it in the gig bag. Mm-hmm. And uh, they provide a cabinet. So Mesa Boogie, you know, forever. Roto Sound Strings for as long as I can remember. Martin is one of the nicest people I've ever met. I ran into him at NAM several years ago. We got to talking, and he's just, they've been so generous. As, and so has Ivan as a Mesa, Line 6, everybody, JH Audio, everyone's just been really, really great. And I think if you cultivate those relationships and have realistic expectations, you know, there's a lot that can be done. And, and I love promoting the product. Like, once I, I started on the Dean Markley Blue Steels, and that's just, you know, they were cryogenically treated, and I was broke, so they were supposed to stay clean for a while. You know, I was still, <laughs> boi- I was still boiling my strings back then. Yeah. Um, you get them in and out quick, and you get another couple practices. Little did I know if you bother to clean the strings after every practice real quick, they last a long time. And put the guitar away. Yeah. <laughs> put it in the case, close it up, keep the air off it. Yeah, Roto Sound's been hooking me up for many years. I used the Swing Bass 66 series, and I use a 110 for my B string. It's very thin. So my string gauges are really, really light compared to like the more low slung Motley Crue type sound where you want to play you know, like a bass boomer or something like that. So, But again, I am a more percussive player, so I need quick rebound and, and a real bright, punchy, punchy tone to it. Nice. And since you mentioned the B string, you're predominantly a five string player, right? Yeah, I switched to five string within six months of playing bass. It was kind of coming up at the time and it was... You know, everyone's like, oh, but it's ironic because I got that and I didn't use that string for, I don't know, a year or two because it was still, we were still all playing E. Yeah. You know, this was the late 80s, early 90s, so all the metal was uptuned and fast and, and then it wasn't until people started to learn to fret the guitar to where I could go down to B and also, oh, it got a little bit lower, we got a little bit lower, and then Korn blessed us with the Mariana Trench tuning and it saved you know bass playing because the strings were so low and so loose like even today i play mostly an a and a sharp so that's pretty low yeah you know once you get the bass set but it's not a lot of tension there so you have to really learn to play delicately but yet aggressive and fast at the same time so having that extra string is just there's no question for me now if i want to go and play slap bass or something like that i have a four string i mean that i would use for that because it's just physically easier and cleaner sure well and the spacing Gives you a little more room. Yeah, because once you start getting that same spacing, you know, I even turned at a Gibson Explorer that I had, where I was a four string, and I turned it into a five string. Wow. And then the, it was so cramped that it's just a wall piece now. It looks great. And it was a good luthier experience for me to realize that I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> to not, you know, having to take it to somebody and get it done right. But yeah. Everyone's, well, I didn't, they make five five string explorers. I know they don't. <laughs> there you go. Well, and I think a lot of times the necessity being the mother of invention, when musicians kind of start digging into some of those details of their instruments, and luthier is a whole other art. And I'm greatly appreciative of what they do, but you'll get somebody. I think one of the classic examples I always think of is Billy Sheehan, mm-hmm. and how he took his his bass and modified it, but he still has his original calls it the wife, and it is one of the, by far, and, and Billy, I say this with the utmost kindness, one of the ugliest bases I've ever seen, yeah. because it has a washer the size of a half dollar on the front of it, helping to hold things into place. He dug the kind of the trench for all the wiring with a screwdriver in his hotel room while he was touring. I mean, you know, it, it couldn't be more rustic. But it is the prototype for all of the Billy Sheehan signature bases to follow. Yeah. I mean, that, he walks on water as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know, and he, like, I owe him one forever. I did a, I had a signing at NAM with him uh, right when I was just starting out. You know, the band had got signed, but no one really knew who I was yet at all. And I had to do a signing at the Rotosound booth. And, and they go, oh, you're going to sign with Billy Sheehan. I'm like, you got to, I'm like, I'm fanboy and huge. Yeah. He was so gracious and kind. And like his line was all the way down the aisle, 
And like two of my friends came up and said, hey, bro, it looks like you're doing well. Like I had nobody. Yeah. And he just got me on the back. He's like, don't worry, man. It'll come. You know, it'll be fine. Let's go get a beer. You know, he was just such a humble guy and, and really kind to me. And I appreciate it so much. Yeah, he's, he's a superb dude. But coming back to gear, pedal wise, I'm sure you have because the kind of sound, the kind of music you're playing. Is, is drawing on pedals. What have you got on your board? Uh, well, I have two different boards. I have a small flight board that I built, and then I'm actually rewiring my large board now, but obviously a tuner. And then I have a chorus pedal, uh, distortion, and uh, a wah pedal, of course, because no bassist should go anywhere without a wah pedal. And then I use a Sans amp, um, and that's more of a tweaking the room thing than I rely on it. I mean, for years I didn't use them at all. I also have like a rack mounted Sans amp in the rack itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for front of house so that I can, you know, give them whatever signals they need. Pedal wise, like in Five Finger Death Punch, I didn't use any pedals. It wasn't required. It was just straightforward metal. There was nothing kind of to it. But a lot of the other stuff, one of my favorite things is to put on a chorus pedal and open the envelope on the wah pedal. But, you know, wah pedals are not meant to be used like gas pedals. You know, that's, that's more of a guitar thing. You yeah. Know? When I use it, I float it. I get it about partway open, and I work. I play with the cue until I get exactly the ult I'm looking for, and then I work with the effects pedal that's in front of it, be a delay or a chorus. And it's amazing with overdrive. Like I definitely have a, a bass overdrive on everything because I don't really care for a lot of the overdrives that are built into amps because they're just kind of here's some fuzz. It doesn't really work. I need to really tweak based on how I EQ my bass and what I'm playing and with that pedal's cue as well. So I can get that thing to talk, bark, scream, screech, make crazy noise for the vamp outros. You know, it's and I've heard people just say, "I've never heard a bass sound like that before." I'm like, I'm not sure if that's an insult or not, but you know, <laughs> it's fun. And I can, you know, that's just from years of I'm not going to go out tonight. I'm going to sit here and noodle in my room, but I didn't have anything to work on. So, you know, let's put some pedals together. And and coming from a mechanic background, I'm into gear and wiring. You know, I, I wired my entire in-ear rig for the entire band from scratch. I wire all my pedal boards, I do my power supplies, I do everything. I find it it's relaxing and meditative for me to, to do that. And that's why I have like this room set up here where I can work and go in my lab and the wife will come down and goes, you, you soldering again? I'm like, you know, why don't you just buy cables? I'm like, what fun is that? You know? Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So once I got into, you know, understanding signal flow, that led me to become an audio instructor, and I taught recording for six years at the LA Recording School. So I was in experimenting with microphones and teaching SSL and Neve consoles, tape theory, microphone theory, like all this, you know, the basics of sound, how your ears move, all of it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just geek out on all that stuff. So it's just, I mean, I sat there and rearranged pedals for a weekend just to find out what would happen because there was no literature at the time. You know, I go, there's got to be a game structure thing going on here, so let's figure it out. And once I finally got my chain together, then but I got it down to just a couple of pedals. There used to be 13 or 14 on the board. It's absurd. But I did it just to do it. You know? Sure. And I had people walk in and go, wow, that, that's a lot of pedals. I'm like, don't worry. It's just it's a project I'm working on. Yeah, I'm not going to do that to you today. So. Got you. Well, and just like yourself, there's so many people, especially when it comes to the electronic side of things, there's a lot of pedal manufacturers do you have any favorites particularly that you like? Uh, no, I think if you make a good pedal, I'll play it. Some of the things, you know, I like to stick with the boss stuff for the smaller boards because mm -hmm. it's small, you know, and it's rugged. I mean, I've, who hasn't kicked a boss pedal across the room by accident? You know, I've got piles of boss tuners that I've collected from people that mm -hmm. said, oh, it's working or it doesn't work. It still works. Yeah. It's beat to hell, but it still works. So there's a lot of that. Uh, Qtron makes some really fun pedals. But, you know, they're a the size of a small refrigerator, so you kind of have to, you know, I just have a whole bin full of pedals if I want to, you know, create. But as far as touring goes, you know, make me a good pedal, I'll use it. And there's always a new one coming out. It's maddening. You know, some of the new dark glass stuff that's coming out I've been getting exposed to, and it sounds magnificent. So it's like technology is coming along, and you have to, like, I have this giant rig here, and I'm doing everything I can to not bring it. Yeah. You know? And in video, I didn't have any backline at all. I just played a my base pedal board, Sans amp, and in-ears. And the whole thing just, you know, went through front of house, so I didn't have to carry any gear because I was already, you know, packing a trailer and driving a bus back then. So it was uh, enough to lighten up the trailer the best I could. <laughs> nice, nice. Now, as we look ahead, you're predominantly playing now with Kill Devil Hill, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I've been touring with them for this year. We did a record during 2020, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's done, 
there's like a couple of little tweaks left, so we're working on the release plan for that. Chris Collier actually did that record. He was got a little bit busy doing the corn record, so we got put back for a couple of weeks, but he's finishing it up right now. So the record's amazing. It sounds absolutely fantastic. I'm super excited about it. Now, Mark had reached out to me to play bass for him, and I've known Dewey for 20-something years. Like, we used to jam together in public storage, you know, back in the day, which is the same place, like, in this moment, practice there, we practiced there, Dead Set, which became in this moment, and then Five Finger Death Punch, like, we were all just, like, this little little village we had going on. So it was, it was a no-brainer for me just to join that band. It's fun, and playing with Johnny Kelly is a blessing. He's just a fantastic drummer. And it's, you know, that slower, kind of sludgier rock for me. So it's given me, I mean, I get these huge, fat bass grooves and stuff that I get to lay down instead of having to, you know, just play 50,000 notes a second. Sure. You know, it's, just, it's a really fun vibe for me. I, I remember right now I was listening to an old down record, driving to work, and I'm like, man, I'd really like to be in a band like this one of these times. And I guess that was something I put up to God because he mm -hmm. gave it to me. And here we are. And Unveil the Strength has been, you know, working behind the scenes really hard. Our record is also done, and we've been promoting a lot of stuff, but that band's going to go out on a tour in 2022. So we're just working on coinciding how both bands are going to tour at the same time. Got you. And as a quick side note, I do want to mention with Unveil the Strength, coffee. It, there's something that goes with metal and coffee because David Ellison's got coffee. You guys have coffee. Yeah, it, well, you know, everybody it, was doing beer forever. And like, I don't really drink anymore. So I was just kind of like, we're like, well, we could do some coffee. And like, unfortunately, they never made a decaf, you know, because I, I kind of kicked off caffeine a little while ago. But uh, it was fun. We worked with some local grocers in Austin, Texas, where mm -hmm. my singer lives. So we're doing the whole thing in house. And like, we were ready to go out on tour in. March of 2020 is when everything was getting put together, and we all know what happened then. Yeah. So we all sat home for nine months. My shop was closed. You know, I had to get into a long battle with the governor and all that stuff to get us reopened, and we eventually got open again. But there was a lot of makeup time to do, and then the touring industry is just so dicey right now. Between, you know, do you want to go there versus who wants to carry the liability and everything? So we just said, you know what, let's just let's just do something else for right now, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna see how everything shakes out and if we're able to tour. So when Kill Devil Hill calls me and they're like, oh, we got dates, we got this and this and this, and it's a fly date. I'm like, oh, I love fly dates. They're so much fun because I'm only gone four or five days and, you know, get to play a bunch of shows and then fly back home. And so I got to check out what's it like to get on an airplane right now? Yeah. When I go to this state, can I walk into this club with the mask on or off? Are there going to be any people there? You know, are they afraid to come to the show because there's so much, you know, information floating around, you know, be it true or not? that people have decided, hey, I'm not going to go, or I'm going to go. Some are defined, we're going to go, you know. Yeah. So the shows ended up being really good. And for the first half of the year, we just focused on open states. I'm going to use the term open. And uh, <laughs> we went and played there. Yeah. So I was thrilled to do that. Um, but, you know, we just played a couple dates in California, and it was good reception. People were out. And, you know, the L.A. show was very different from the, like, Fresno show, let's say. Sure. But, they were both good shows and they're different towns, different environments, so different rules. And I, I totally get it. So there was just a lot of what's the best thing that we can do in the meantime. And I said, well, I don't want to make beer. And he's like, what about we should do some coffee? Because we're always talking about coffee and making <laughs> coffee. And so we did it and it was a lot of fun and it's gone well. People are buying it, you know, and you get a little, you get a whole pack with you get a sticker and a coffee and a whole thing. And you get to join our mailing list and keep up with what we're doing that way. You know, when we come out, you know, we can meet and talk about that too. Because I'll meet anybody for coffee. I don't care. You know, I'll you <laughs> well, the morning blend is a lovely, flavorful coffee. It's got a couple of different beans. And press start, I will say, if you're trying to cut off a caffeine, that is not a drink for you because. Yeah, the kill coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That just like, whoa, I'm ready to, to rock after that. But both yeah. very tasty, both very fun to drink and and i am certainly enjoying them keeps us going in these winter months so the press start was uh came out with our video for the song kill all the memories gotcha. and, and if you watch the video it, it's like we are in a video game and you're the first person shooter so it was a lot of fun it's like oh we should do one kill, kill your morning you know so it was uh yeah it was fun and we got more coming you know we have one for every song that comes out we're finding that, you know, we have to, have to go down and do taste tests and check out different blends and then kind of assign it to which one we want. And, and we, you know, we had the whole, you know, whole bean versus ground, you know, because mm -hmm. there's purists out there. You know, I would prefer the whole bean and a French press myself. The beauty of the whole bean is you can set the gauge on your grinder and make it to what yes. you're making it in. 
And I hope a lot of people start to learn that. Yeah. You know, having by by our coffee, they learn a little bit more about how to make a proper cup of coffee. Because like I don't drink a lot of coffee anymore, but mm -hmm. I want it. You know, it's like a whiskey; it has to be right. I don't want some Jameson garbage. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? So with the coffee, it's the same thing. But I have a good proper cup of coffee. Well, I've had the good fortune of going to a class with a champion Italian barista. And oh, it's really. So we've I've been versed on the different coffee makers and the draw time from the espresso and so forth and so forth. So it is a whole other world. But again, I find it quite compatible with music, you know, so that that's fabulous. But let's come back to music. So yes. we've talked touring with Kill Devil Hill. And what other plans are there for the future? Right now, like, uh, we're going to release the record in the next couple months uh, for Kill Devil Hill. They're just getting the plan together for that. Um, Unveil the Strength is looking to start booking tours probably March, April, somewhere in there, and get out for the summer. You know, we're a new band. I mean, we've been around for a minute, but we, don't, we haven't been out touring. You know, because yeah. like I said, we worked for two and a half straight years to get everything ready. And right when we were getting ready to go out, our guitar player left and ironically joined Five Finger Death Punch. So we had to find another guitar player, and uh, we'll just leave that there. And uh, so that set us back a little bit, just because they had bring the new guy in, and he was in London as well as was the last one. So it took us a while to get him over here. Gotcha. The visas and everything like that. So now we finally got him over here. So we're you know getting the show together now. But so we're gonna get out and probably do some smaller club shows and you know House of Blues type stuff like that and. You know, staying out of the bars, but trying to do just theater tours and club tours and things like that. So there's a little bit of politics that we're working through right now. We're going to mm -hmm. get that happening. I'm super excited for people to see this show and, and hear the music. It's just we've been working on it really hard on it for a long time. And if you listen to the production, you can hear the quality in it. You can hear the blood, sweat and tears that went into that record. You know, we sent that record to Henrik Gud over in Sweden to do the mix because we wanted a, you know, European style metal mix. We didn't want the... The mixes that we keep hearing here in the states over and over and over with the same drum sounds and the same kind of you yeah. know we really wanted that you know that metal sound but still commercial enough you know because Mark's vocals are fantastic yeah. and you know, he doesn't scream at everybody the whole time so it's it's a blessing <laughs> and uh, so get that band out and I'm just looking forward to trying trying to balance the two bands you know because Johnny Kelly my drummer in Kill Devil Hill is in like four projects he's in Quiet Riot Danzig Kill Devil Hill hookers and blow and all this stuff so we play with like a musical drummer situation it's like spinal tap but they're not blowing up yeah it's just kind of like oh, oh mike's playing today okay great you know like yeah. oh, mike, you know? so and it's a different show with different drummers like especially as a bass player so oh, totally it's a challenge schedule wise but everyone's open and they work you know and they understand and because we're all professionals like it's not a big ego thing we all just want to perform and have fun and, and have great shows and i'm looking forward to more people being comfortable coming to shows because mm -hmm. I've been doing all the shows, and I, I've been fine, and all the people I know are fine, so I think we're all going to be okay in the long run, and hopefully we can just, I mean, I just remember there was always three or four shows a month that I was buying tickets to growing up, and I, I'd love to see that happen again. Very cool. And where's the best place? If people want to find out, where should they be looking to find out if, where you guys are going to be, what you're up to? Um, just unveilthestrength.com is, is an all-inclusive site. It has everything about the band, our merch. Any upcoming news? Obviously, there's you know, Devil Strength Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. and same with Kill Devil Hill. You can find them both on Instagram and Facebook and all that. Kill Devil Hill kind of took a hiatus for a while, and then when Rex left to go do his solo project, it was another year or two before they you know put another record up and then got me involved in it. So then it took us another year or so from there. So we're going to have to do a whole new push with that band, which is one of my specialties. I really like doing that. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. And I love doing press. I love talking to you. It's great. You know, and I have a lot of friends out when it's time here. We're ready to run. Let's do it. So it'll all be popping up soon. Yeah. See my pages, you know, keep you can follow me on both Instagram and Facebook and all that. I don't I don't Twitter or TikTok, but it's too much, you know. Oh, one of them's too silly and one of them's too silly and one of them's really effing silly. Well and what I will point out for people, when you're looking for Kill Devil Hill, look for Kill Devil Hill Music dot com because there's actually a place named Kill Devil Hill. Yes. That's where they came from. Yeah, it was an old, it was a Originally, like a, a port for pirates to come in back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it up. It was, I mean, as soon as I've gone to see the band play before, and I, like I said, I knew Dewey for years, and you know, I've met Rex and all that stuff, and hung out, and I was always a fan. But then I started thinking, like, it's a great name. Like, where did it come from? So I just started to type it in, and then it popped up, and I read this whole, you know, quick Wikipedia. Yeah. 
uh, summation of it. I was like, well, that's fucking good, you know, because, you know, I was in the worst named band in history, which is now a household name. So, you know, like, so I don't fight with names. If you got one, I'm in, you know. There's certainly been a, a long list of bad band names, and many of them got changed, uh, fortunately, I think, because... We were going to change the one. They said, yeah, I think we should change it before coming. Like, it's so bad, you have to keep it. You know, and we kept it, and now it just rolls off the tongue like butter. You know, it's perfect, and it's a great name. So, well, the the band I played with in fifth grade was named The Incredibles, so it was pretty, <laughs> pretty bad. But I digress, Matt. We appreciate you taking time to chat with well, us, thank you. telling us your journey and all this great stuff, folks. Stay on top of all of this music that Matt's involved with. Look for Kill Devil Hill, Unveil the Strength, all kinds of fun stuff. Yes. If you look, he's probably there. You've seen him here, Matt Snell on Bass Musician Magazine. Thank you. <laughs>